Welcome to Raven Talk, the official podcast of the Raven Tribe. The Raven Tribe is a home for warriors on the path and is dedicated to training warriors for the battlefield of life. Visit us on the web at theraventribe.com where you can learn more information on membership, warrior training, as well as links to our official YouTube channel, Facebook group, apparel store, and our official bookstore, Marshall Books. Welcome back, Tribe. Today we're here with special guest Alan Burris. We're going to be discussing Hapkido, self-defense, your warrior's edge, and survive and defend today with Alan. Alan, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Great, great. Well, we're happy to have you on, Alan, and there's a couple of different things we're going to talk about. Uh, to get started, though, I'd like to ask you to do me a favor and please, for the sake of the audience listening at home who may not have uh, been familiar with you in the past, can you please give us a little bit of background about yourself, how you got involved in the training community in martial arts and in self-defense? Sure. I'll try to put a lot into as short a time as I can, but I, mean, I, like a lot of people, started reading the Fred Nest and Bruce Tegner books in the 70s and finally had a chance to start judo in the 80s when I was in high school. That was my first formal martial art training. Then I left for the Army, did some karate in Fort Bragg, North Carolina at Wolf's Karate, did a little bit of Taekwondo when I was over in Korea with the military. Then I got out of the military and did a little Hapkido, a little more karate, a little judo with Shihan Dennis Dallas and Helena. And then went to college, then went off to Japan, then decided to write my first book. Because if we back up a little bit, I had been a fan of Mark McYoung and Peyton Quinn and some other authors from Paladin Press. And I got to meet Mark, and we became friends. And so he encouraged me to write a book that I had an idea for, so when I came back from Japan, I wrote my first book, Hard One Wisdom. He wrote the foreword. And everyone asked me, what are you a black belt in? And I wasn't a black belt in anything. I had trained in all these different things and had color belts, but I never made it up to black belt level. And so early 96, the book was finished. I decided to leave Riverside, California, and I wanted to go back to Korea because I enjoyed it when I was there with the military, and I chose Hapkido as the martial arts that I wanted to actually focus on and be dedicated to achieve a black belt in. So in 96, I went back. I was teaching English to pay the bills, just like I did to pay the bills in Japan when I lived there. Started training two days or two times a day, five days a week, and once on Saturday. So I was going to 11 Hapkido classes a day. And I'm still under that same instructor today. And, you know, that's been over 20 years now that I've been training under Yi Jun Gyu and his instructor, Kim Young Jong, um, in the Pop Keto curriculum that I teach nowadays. Now, Alan, for anybody that's picked up your book or picked up any of your training DVDs, it's something that comes across very clearly that you're very much about, you know, a very streetwise type of training with the martial arts. Did you find, and I also train in Hapkido, and I've had kind of mixed um, experiences with people that train in Hapkido, but did you find that Hapkido lent itself to that type of real-world application? It does to a certain degree. And there are things in Hapkido that, like the Hapkido that I practice under you know, Kim Young Dong and Yi Jun Gyu, we do some forms. And the forms have a Chinese influence because Kim Young Jong you know, he also had a wushu background when he was younger. And so Kwan Jin Yim believed in some forms. And you don't need to do forms to learn how to fight. And I've never done anything in a form out in a street fight or working security. And But that doesn't mean forms are useless, like some people will say. I think there's value in them, but it's not necessarily value that's directly applicable to the street. So I think Hop Keto has a little bit of both. And that's one reason that when I teach things, I teach self-defense programs that are just purely self-defense and more combative-based. And I teach my Hapkido martial art program for those that want to learn an art. An art that can also help you defend yourself, but there are still art elements um, that aren't necessarily practical. And, you know, all you're wanting to do is fight. And so I divide my time on both sides of that fence. 
Now let's talk about that other side of the fence. You run under the banner of Survive and Defend. Tell me something about the work that you're doing under that banner. Survive and Defend, the stuff I do there is purely safety and self-defense oriented for people that are not interested in learning a complete martial art, but they want to be safe. They want to learn how to defend themselves. One of the big things I do under that as well are the active shooter response training. I'm part of a team that teaches here in Missoula under a Safari Land training group course, and I've also developed my own programs, and I'm working on a book to help people in that area as well. And it's teaching them how they can increase their survivability if they ever encounter such a situation. Now, Alan, that's a very timely subject. The active shooter training is you know, something that's popping up all over the United States now. I think as a country, we're finally starting to take this kind of thing seriously. Um, it's a little bit of a shame. Other countries have been very well aware of this, you know, for, for decades. Um, and I think it's just now that we're starting to, again, take it seriously. What are you uh, seeing as far as the the students coming through your doors to take this training? Is Are there people that are just from everyday walks of life? Are they, you know, what's motivating them to come into training? Are they being sent by their, their employer or are they seeking this out on their own? Most of the people that are doing it here in Missoula come from the educational systems, whether it's the public schools or the university. They've also done hospitals and government agencies. And some of them are being told, we want you to go take this training because the superintendent of the school here in District 1 in Missoula wants everyone to go through this training. And we have had people come and they, oh, I was told to go. Or I remember a, a guy recently came to the class and said, well, I'm just here because my coworkers came and, and they said they weren't comfortable with me not having the training too. And at the end of the class, the guy's like, I see why my coworkers wanted me to have this training because now they're all on the same sheet of music and they actually have a plan. And they, it empowers people, just regular people, to know that they can do something to increase their survivability rather than hiding and hoping under a desk and being killed. Now, the reason I asked you that question, Alan, is because I wanted to get an idea of the mindset of the people you know that are coming into the classroom with you. And it sounds like you have a good rate of success in getting through to them and getting the point across that this is valuable training. Now, you mentioned that you don't want people just to kind of, you know, hide under a desk and, and wait for something bad to happen. Tell me a little bit about, about the approach that your program and the program that you teach uh, there in Missoula takes with, um, you know, the guidelines for dealing with an active shooter situation. We teach a three-pronged approach, and the program under Safari Land that we're doing is run, lock, fight. The, my personal programs, it's the same concepts, but I often call them escape, deny, attack, back. But they, they mean the same thing. First of all, if you can get away and escape to safety by running, great. Second, you either lock, okay, you deny that person access to get to you. It can keep you safe. If you can't do one of the first two, you have to fight. You have to attack back and take it to the person with a weapon if you carry a weapon, improvised weapons if that's all that's available, or empty-handed if you have nothing else. But you can't just hide under a desk and be a statistic, you know, such as like what happened at Columbine and some other places. I am 100% positive if the people in the Orlando uh, nightclub would have been through our course or in the night. 49 people would not have been killed. Some people would have died, yes, but not so many. And I've been on the radio in Florida and New York and Texas, California, talking about active shooter situations after Orlando, and I am positive that not as many people would have died if they would have had this up mindset. Now, Alan, that's very important. Mindset is, is probably the, the primary tool uh, that anybody can have in that kind of situation. Let me ask you this. Have, is, what's been your experience with people coming through the doors, maybe people that have no background in training at all, see the value in it? Do they stop there, or do you, are you aware if they are able to seek out other additional training or, or you know, more training to you know, complement what they've learned in the basic courses? Some have sought out different courses. I mean, I've had people 
seek me out for additional self-defense training. Um, people have gone and, uh, you know, obtained firearm training and learned more about firearms. And we are constantly asked if we could do follow-up training and refresher courses. And we actually have some people that go back through the eight-hour course again. So we've had people that have come through the course more than once. And they've said that, yeah, they benefited the second time as well. Um, we're working right now on trying to get a four-hour uh, refresher course that would for the people that have already gone through the eight-hour one. We just we're not there yet because we're still trying to get everybody in the school district and university through the eight-hour course. Now, Alan, I, I'm sure that there's some challenges in putting together this kind of program, and I wanted to get your opinion on this. Uh, I've been put in a position where I've had to develop a similar program for the agency that I work for, and it's not it's not easy, even for people with a training background. This is kind of a very specialized thing. There's a lot of elements you have to really understand well. And I had to defer to some experts uh, and not try to do it just from, from my you know knowledge bank. What would you recommend to people that are out there? Because I think this is something that is similar to concerns people have with self-defense teachers. Uh, you know, a lot of people are well-meaning, but sometimes what they're putting out there, the product they're putting out there, some, sometimes can do a little bit more harm than good. What would you recommend to people that are sincere in their desire to want to, you know, promote this type of training, bring it to people in their area? You know, because I'm, I'm leery about encouraging everyone to go out there and do your, you know, put together your own program. Do you have anything set up like an affiliate training program where you can come out and train trainers? Do you do anything like this to kind of help with the quality control of, uh, of teaching others how to train this material? I don't personally, but the program, the eight-hour program that we're doing here, all of us instructors have been certified to Safari Land, a training group, um, to teach their class. And we took the Safari Land class and we have modified it a little. I mean, after doing it for three years and having three to 4,000 people through the class, we've changed it some and we've tried to assess what we do to make it better. But Safari Land does go and teach uh, train the trainer programs around the country. They're not all as successful as the one we have here in Missoula. And Sandy Wall, who was actually works for Safari Land, and he developed this course, he was here a couple months ago, and he said that Missoula was doing more than anybody else he knew of in the country. Um, and it's just sort of a unique situation where we have the university police, the Missoula City Police, the Sheriff's Department, uh, university people, uh, district school people, all working together to bring this training to people in our community. You know, we got hospital people and some other folks working there too. So we have a, a quite a group of people working collectively to make our community safe. And that's pretty unique. And it's, it's excellent work and I commend you for, for doing so. Alan, so we, we talked a little bit about your martial arts background. We talked about your classes that you teach for, for people seeking that martial arts experience looked at some of the practical things that you're doing and teaching out there in the community. Now I'd like to switch gears a little bit. And as you know, the, the Raven Tribe is, is dedicated to developing warriorship in in all facets of life, not just, you know, on the mat or in the ring or in the dojo. And you have been very successful with a program that is very much along the same lines, uh, you know, very similar philosophy. Can you tell me a little bit about your Warrior's Edge program? Certainly. When I say the warrior's edge, you know, I'm talking about an edge that a person gets in life when they apply principles based on the different warrior cultures to their everyday living. And when this sort of first started, I got out of the Army back in 89. It was too late to apply for college. I worked in a sawmill and I went down to L.A. and um, applied for the LAPD until a buddy's dad, who was an LA Fire Department, talked me out of it and said, you'd be better off going to college. So I went to college in 90. I hadn't been in school for five years, and I signed up for some honors courses and a pretty heavy credit load. And the person there that was helping us, the advocate that was helping us with our, our schedules and stuff at the orientation, you know, she's like, 
are you sure you really want to take this many classes with honors classes when you haven't been in school for a long time? And I just looked at her and said, I'm a sniper. I can do it. Now, she, the look on her face, you know, you could tell, didn't have a clue what I was talking about. But I knew inside what I was talking about because I knew what I had done in the military, and I knew that I could apply that same thing to college and succeed. And I got straight A's that semester. And so that's sort of that warrior's edge. I'm taking things from the military, from the martial arts, from the warrior cultures, and looking at how those can make you a better person and make you succeed in the different endeavors that you take on in life and get through those challenges that we all have to face. Now, Alan, how do you teach this material to people? How do you reach out to people and do your mentoring with them in developing this in their own personal lives? You know, I try to be a model for the, the, the handful of students that I have here in Missoula. And I just teach a small hot keto program. I never wanted to open my own big school and be commercial. So even when I was in law school and even practicing law, I was teaching on the side. And so I try to help those handful of students the most. I travel and do seminars where I try to talk keto, but also some of my philosophy. I do some different speaking engagements where I teach you know, about this philosophy. And then on my Facebook and in my blog, I try to write about these things and, and share them that way with either the videos that I do or the Facebook post. You know, sometimes it's just a quote, but other times when I have time, I'll write a few paragraphs or a longer article about something such as courage or honor or commitment or dedication. You know, these principles that you find in the warrior cultures that are so important to, to life. Now, you mentioned your, your Facebook group and your post that you put up, and, and I follow it, and I love it. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of quotations. I think that there's a lot of wisdom that can be, uh, you know, conveyed in that very simple, you know, way. And I personally see the things that you post, you know, on a daily basis. I follow it, and I really do enjoy it. Can you tell the audience at home a little bit specifically about your philosophy? And you mentioned a few of the things like courage and honor. But what is the, you know, the, what is at the core of what you want to teach? What is it that you find the most value in that you want to share with other people? I want people to live life to the fullest, doing good things for themselves and others, and just enjoy everything good and be more positive. And I think that's, you know, in a nutshell, what is most important to me. I want people to enjoy their families, enjoy their friends, and be a positive influence in the world around us, you know, in a place where there's just too much negative. And I think warriors with the courage and the strength and the training are those that can stand up to the injustices and the negativity, whether that's a negative comment or is somebody actually trying to physically hurt or kill other people. You know, Alan, you mentioned that negativity, and I'd like to ask you, when you were inspired to do this project and to, you know, to bring it to life, was it, re- in, in a sense, was it reactionary? Did you feel like you were trying to, you know, solve a, a problem that you saw that was clear and present? It was more I just want to be a positive influence. I mean, I've been a teacher of some sort since, I mean, when I was in the military, I taught at the 2nd Infantry Division Scout Sniper School. When I was an undergraduate in college, I taught an honors class, Strategies for Success, for two years. Then I taught in Japan. Then I taught in Korea. Now I'm teaching martial arts. I teach CLEES to attorneys, continued legal education. I've always been a teacher of something. And so this is just one more avenue to try to share messages and influence people hopefully in a positive way. Well, it's a very positive message, and I think it's something very important. Uh, You and I have spoken about it, um, and you know that I come from a very, you know, similar point of view. I I have a passion for trying to have people incorporate these things in their lives. From my own personal experience, in doing so, I, I often find myself very frustrated because I feel like maybe I'm not you know, the best at conveying the message or maybe I'm frustrated with the student's unwillingness or inability to really grasp what I'm trying to share with them. 
have you run into any situations like that in your teaching career where you really wanted to instill these values in people and they just kind of weren't at the right place yet? Certainly. And we all have our shortcomings and our failures. And Sometimes I wonder, could I have expressed something differently that maybe would have helped that person better? Um, you know, some, there are some people you're just not going to connect with and not everybody's going to like you and you have to accept that. But I'm also pretty self-critical, so I always look at myself and think, you know, what could I have done better? Um, how can I get a message across to somebody in a better way? And so I'm always sort of that self-reflection about what am I doing, how can I do it better, and especially when I screw up and do something wrong, and then I try to look at myself and it's like, well, okay, maybe I shouldn't have said it that way because it, it didn't come across the way I wanted Rather than helping a person, it may be inflamed the situation, and I know better than that, but I let ego or whatever else cloud my vision for that little bit and didn't accomplish you know, what I really am for. And I think that happens to all of us at times. Alan, what advice would you give to somebody that is receptive, that is willing to learn and wants to you know, get walking on the warrior path? Where would you have them start? What type of education should they seek out? What type of books should they be reading? Anything you can share with us that you think would be a good starting place for somebody that wants to really make the investment in their own lives to start making positive changes? I think you, the person needs to take a, a balanced approach. And so I would encourage the person to do some kind of physical training and educate themselves on physical training, both on diet and exercise, but then also, you know, I, I believe a warrior does train in a martial art. That's part of warriorship is, you know, we learn those skills because that way we can stand up to injustices. What martial art isn't as important as finding an instructor that's a good person that can help you grow in whatever path you choose. So you want the, the physical martial art, the physical exercise, and, you know, you don't have to be a super strict dietitian, but you need to stay in good health. Then you need to also educate yourself, you know, on a variety of things. I mean, I'd like a person, you know, to be well-rounded and know things about the world. But then I also want them to include some books and studying things, you know, study the classics, art of war. You know, Book of Five Rings, but also some contemporary things on warriorship, whether it's, you know, Dan Millman's Way of the Peaceful Warrior, one of my favorite books, or any of the others. The more you study, the more you read, and you apply little gems and pieces from those, the more full you will be. And then I think it's important to that complete balance that you also have to have the spirit element. And that could be a specific uh, religion that somebody follows. It could be a meditation, but something to nourish that part of our, our body, of our soul. You know, it's the old body, mind, spirit. And I really do believe all three are important. And so I would encourage anyone that wants to walk the path to make sure that they're balanced and they're getting all three of those. Well, very sound advice, Alan. And I think it's something that uh, anybody can definitely improve the quality of their life by, by following these suggestions. Now, Alan, before we wrap up today, I wanted to ask you if people out there are interested in getting you out to their, their place of business, their dojos, their companies, their agencies to do training, whether it be martial arts or whether it be, you know, real world survival training and, you know, the active shooter programs that you're doing. Where can people reach out to you to find out more information about those programs and also about the um, the Warrior's Edge program? Where can they reach out and, and learn more about what you're doing? So, SurviveAndDefend.com and YourWarriorsEdge.com. And I have the two different websites because I really, like we said earlier, I separate the two different things. Um, Barise.com is currently under construction, but YourWarriorsEdge.com surviveanddefend.com, ton of information at both of those websites and a way to contact me at both those websites as well. Now, Alan, you also have a lot of, um, of media available, books and DVDs. Can you tell the audience a little bit about what you have available for them if they're interested in picking something up and you know watching or reading at home? Certainly. I have 
four books on self-defense. Two of them are just collections of other works and less, you know, the 101 tips and the 101 more tips. But the fighter's mindset and the hard one wisdom are books that are, they focus more on real self-defense. I also have a novel that actually sells better than all of my self-defense things because there's a bigger market out there. And if you're in, if you're into thrillers, it's about a, an attorney who calls up an old army buddy and they t- take on a child trafficking ring with their fighting and military skills because the law wasn't working. Then I also have 11 DVDs out on various aspects of martial arts. If you want joint locks, if you want to learn how to use the cane to defend yourself, if you're in the security profession, or if you just want some simple self-defense, I got DVDs on all of those with more to come. Excellent. Well, Alan, I want to thank you again for being on the show today. It was great having you on. And I encourage everybody listening at home to definitely look you up, to follow you on Facebook. I uh, mentioned you know, during the interview that I personally follow your, your Facebook group. I, I find it great, and I look forward to seeing the posts that you put up every day. So I'm sure other people would find it equally you know, beneficial. So with that said, Alan, I want to thank you again for being part of the show, and we look forward to having you back on in the future. I really enjoy that, and thank you for having me on. It's been enjoyable, and I hope we can do it again. Great. Thank you, Alan.